All right, well, um, I'm uh, excited to talk a little bit today. Um, we're gonna cover a handful of topics. One is just kind of generally, what, what do we mean by Industry 4.0? It's a term that gets tossed around a lot. Um, and I've got uh, maybe a, a little bit of a unique perspective on it that I wanna share. Um, and then we're gonna talk tactics and tools and, and hopefully, um, my goal is that you know you leave this half an hour having learned some really practical things that you can turn around and implement. So um, the first thing that I want to do is just to clarify my perspective and my biases that are going into this and what experiences I'm I'm speaking from. Um, so over the last decade, uh, we've grown very um, have over 100 full time engineers. Um, we've done about 250 product builds and implementations and go to market. Um, and so what that provides for me is um, a lot of kind of horizontal knowledge and experience and pattern recognition. And when we you know, say that we really believe in this particular tool, it's, it's not that we tried it once and it worked, it's that we are trying it actively across 30 projects or 50 projects at a time. Um, and it holds up. And so from my perspective is a lot about kind of pattern recognition. Um, and, uh, and that's the, the perspective by which, you know, when I make some recommendations, that's where it's coming from. All right, so let's dive into this thing. Um, the agenda for today, uh, industry 4.0, pitfalls to avoid some insights and tactics. So the first thing that I wanted to do is level set what do I mean by industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution? So the, the term fourth industrial revolution was coined in 2016 by the founder of World Economic Forum. And at a very high level, I think we all understand that this refers to kind of the ongoing um, automation of traditional manufacturing and industrial practices uh, where we are using machine-to-machine um, -machine communication we're using and leveraging Internet of Things, and they're coming together to form some key outputs around um, self-monitoring, around smart machines that can analyze and diagnose failure um, without human intervention, you know, greater levels of automation, so on and so forth. So that's kind of the stuff that I, I think everybody's on the same page about. Um, now, here's a little bit of a new perspective, which is, why is that important today? And what is the special moment that we are living in today? Um, and how does that relate to where we are over the course of history? So I wanna start by throwing a couple of data points your way. Throughout human history, leading up to let's say 1990, we had created several exabytes of information as a human species from the dawn of time until around 1990 couple exabytes. Today, in 2021, not too much later, we are creating that same amount of data every single day. A couple other data points. By the year 2025, they are projecting that the amount of data we'll generate each day is expected to reach 463 exabytes per day. For context, all the words ever spoken by humans fit into only roughly five exabytes. So what, is, what does that mean? Let me actually go back for a second. It means that the amount of information that we are creating is totally unprecedented in human history. And the important thing is that the transmission rate of human speech and human communication is clocked at about 39 bits per second. And our brains, as we know it today, only have the storage capacity of 2.5 petabytes. For context, one exabyte is 1,000 petabytes. The important thing here is that we have now, as a human species, outpaced our ability to fully comprehend what is happening around us. And we are going to have to rely on things like AI and machines to actually do some heavy lifting and lead the way. That is just the moment that we are at in history. Um, it's an unprecedented moment. It's only trending in you know, one particular direction. And so the, the time where we could lean back and say that we'll just create better ways for our brains to analyze things um, is over. There's a new paradigm that we're beginning 
Um, and some companies are going to take advantage of that. Some companies are not. Some companies are going to get kind of entrenched in their old ways, um, but the old ways are no longer going to be able to compete. So um, with that in mind, there are a couple key considerations that go into our evaluation of what are the opportunities at this moment in time. So those data points being true, what are the key considerations that either make this um, the right time, the wrong time? Uh, and those are confluence, granularity, and foundations. So that's what we're gonna get into here for a second. So the first one is about confluence. Why we are accelerating at an exponential or asymptotal rate um, is that uh, we are seeing a lot of different fields of technology coming together in ways they haven't before. If we rewind you know, three decades, a lot of these fields in their nascency are happening in silos in academic labs. And now we're seeing them put into practice in industry and these fields are starting to, to come together and reinforce each other. And so that's looking at machine to machine communications, that's looking at the fusion of robotics, AI, nanotechnology, um, even synthetic biology and material sciences and so on and so forth. That's where the kind of the line went, has gone from linear to sharply exponential. This is a fun one that I think a lot about, which is the concept of the importance of granularity. When I say granularity, that means that we are now in new ways able to see high frequency, able to see and then analyze high frequency data. Um, we are able to have sampling and streaming rates like we've never before. They're able to be analyzed through neural networks and we're able to actually do algorithmic execution of these AI models at the edge so that you can do things that are in real time. Why is granularity so important? Um, as humans, we are able to iterate and innovate um, sometimes you know, exponentially, but mostly linearly when we're working with the same data set. With a, the same data set over time, we can look at it from different perspectives. We can try to create some unique combinations of the data. We can apply creativity. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the same data set and there's only so far that you can push the insights and innovation. What we're seeing now is a new data set. And where I would liken it to a point in history is the invention of the microscope. So the microscope was invented around 1590. And with that invention, we were able to see the world in a different level of granularity than ever before, literally through a new lens. And as more powerful microscopes were developed, we were able to see cell division. We we're able to develop cancer treatments. We we're able to pioneer entirely new fields in medicine because our data set is new and different. And that is what we are now seeing as it relates to industry, manufacturing, sensors, um, robotics, so on and so forth. And that, that is kind of a really exciting consideration that's happening right now. The last one is, is kind of an underpinning and that's foundations. Um, you know, I think of like uh, a lot of efforts in bringing smart glasses, you know, or augmented reality, you know, into manufacturing training. Um, and if we rewind even seven years ago, you know, before everybody could just jump on a Zoom, like there were serious bandwidth considerations that were, that were real issues. Um, you know, uh, cellular networks were less prevalent in terms of like being able to have some type of an IOCT system that has a cellular backhaul and maybe a Wi-Fi first connection. Um, so from that perspective, prior to now, the bandwidth may just not have been there, but I think it is there now. And frankly, honestly, we still struggle with it in a lot of our implementations, but there are ways around it um, that kind of enable these like futuristic visions that we may have had for a while, but the foundation wasn't there. Next one, digitization, pretty self-explanatory, interconnectivity. So in the past, it has been very hard to work with different protocols and different languages and uh, data in, in very different formats, we're starting to see a level of interconnectivity that's really exciting and, and kind of unlocking um, new innovation. And then the transparency of data. Um, again, we're starting to be able to pull information out of systems, leverage APIs, 
um, and put things together where you know insights are now possible. So a quick recap, um, uh, I4 is driven by a confluence of technologies. It's not just one particular technology. There's not just one horse we're betting on. Um, new data granularity throughout history has led to breakthrough moments. And the foundations are here to be leveraged. Uh, and I believe that the timing is now to really support the paradigm shifts that, that can happen. So now let's, that's kind of context, background, you know, some of Ben's crazy musings on, on uh, Industry 4.0. Now let's talk about IoT specifically and the role of IoT in driving some of that change. So the first thing that I've got up here is, is um, what we've put together as an IoT maturity model. Actually, Nate Strong is, I think, giving his entire talk about this model in particular. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go over it pretty quickly. Um, but in essence, when we look at IoT, um, not all IoT is equal, not all IoT is as mature as others. And the goal with any type of solution or implementation is really to kind of move towards a level of maturity that ends in kind of ubiquitous computing. So stages uh, one and two are, are um, you know, kind of like your basics, which is that there's an embedded device. So you've got hardware and we are providing it with intelligence using software. Um, but like we're not talking to other machines. Um, the next step is getting this, this you know, smart rock connected. Um, this rock that we've now been, uh, we've provided it thinking capabilities with software. Now we want to get it connected so that that conversation can begin to happen with the cloud, with other devices. We then now are looking at more of an IoT system. Stage five is once you have a system in place, you can start doing some really high value things like predictive maintenance, where we can say, okay, based on a baseline of data and anomalies, that are outside of that baseline, we're predicting machine failure, we're predicting part failure, we're predicting you know, whatever, whatever we're able to predict into the future. Um, the next one is when we start to get prescriptive about making recommendations and solutions to mitigate. So it's not just listening, it's not just reading and fortune telling, it's actually taking an active role and providing agency with the machines to make corrective action. Lastly is a big concept I could talk for a whole hour on ubiquitous computing, you know, but it's more or less just the concept that devices are freely communicating with each other and provided agency um, to uh, take the human factor out of the equation. So with that in mind, the next couple of slides, the next three slides are going to talk about some pitfalls that we've seen. And these pitfalls we've seen over and over again from the perspective of watching 30 to 50 projects at any given point in time play out. And these are some of the pitfalls that we see over and over again. We do our best to steer into them, um, but they are you know, worthy enough to, to jump onto the slide here. So first one is decision paralysis. Um, we see all the time uh, companies that have a great opportunity to innovate, a great opportunity to build some type of a new IoT device or implement some model, simply not able to get consensus or are simply not able to like build the, a compelling enough ROI model to, to pull the trigger. A lot of the times that comes from trying to bite off too much at once, um, trying to, you know, like orchestrate some master five-year roadmap when all you can realistically project is the next six to eight months. And so um, I think decision paralysis across the board, you know, leads to a lot of innovation not coming into this world. Second one is bad investments. What we see all the time is a firm a company has made some bad investments. They've gotten out over their skis in the past. Um, and now they're a little bit gun shy to pull the trigger on the next thing. Um, the thing that we try to really focus on is letting the market uh, or letting the ROI equation lead us and trying to make as small of an investment as possible to achieve and capture the low hanging fruit. One of the things that we are constantly thinking of is let's upfront identify what are the low hanging fruit here? You know, how could we internally monetize this tool um, so that even before we take it to the market, we've got some baseline return on investment. And by the way, if the low hanging fruit doesn't pan out, that's a great signal to not invest further. It's a great signal to invalidate 
a lot of the initial assumptions that we may have made. And so the second thing to avoid is in general, let's just avoid, you know, pilot purgatory. Let's avoid making bad investments. Um, and I think that yeah, it's kind of obvious, but the field would, would benefit greatly from, from that. Um, next is really not leaning on proven frameworks is, is, a, is a pitfall. There are proven models, proven frameworks that work from a workflow perspective that's going to be like agile and lean. Um, from an AI perspective, there are models that you can that are readily available that you can take off the shelf and plug in with minimal engineering work that don't require you to have to have a PhD data scientist on staff. Um, and so the the TLDR here is that when you're looking at a build versus buy, just because you can't find the perfect solution to buy doesn't mean that the build has to be entirely custom. And it doesn't mean that you have to be entirely out, you know, on your own in uncharted territory. Let's lean on proven frameworks. We do it all the time. Um, let's not reinvent the wheel where we don't have to. Let's reinvent the wheel just in the very small differentiated places that, um, you know, could lead to uh, building moats and, you know, really capturing a competitive advantage. Um, lastly is, you know, I can't beat this drum enough. Um, security first mindset, really thinking through um, when you are doing work in IoT, what new vectors of attack are you opening up? Um, how are you building responsibly from the very beginning? Um, and just the, a security mindset from the beginning is, is just critically important. And, and so a pitfall to avoid is that a lot of the times there's kind of a mad dash towards getting an MVP launched. And that's frankly driven because, um, you know, there's timeline pressure, there's budget pressure. And oftentimes what gets cut for new features is security. Um, and so this is, you know, just beating the drum of don't forget security. Think about it from the beginning, make great plans for it invest the budget um, and uh, it's important. So um, quick recap here is uh, get started, do something, start with a pilot, start with an MVP, don't let decision paralysis kill the dreams of an IoT future um, and uh, let the market lead you. And what that means is like, don't over innovate, don't um, build something that you think that you need without having the proper market validation. Next, lean into proven frameworks and experts for a risk-adjusted approach. Part of the reason why people hire Vary is because we've done it before. Um, if we haven't done the specific thing before, we've done things and launched things that are like it, and we're not the only firm. This is kind of you know, a, a, a bullet point around like, find the experts in the field that have done this before and, and bring them into the process. Lastly, don't overlook security implications, enough said. So the next section here is really all about tactics. Um, some of the best practices that we've learned along the way over the last decade of doing this. Uh, so number one is um, I, I have a, a, a presentation on, um, on waterfall versus agile. To cut to the end of that presentation, choose an agile approach um, when uh, building products. Um, it's much more effective than waterfall. And um, we have a lot of blog posts and content uh, on verypossible.com that talks about how specifically we apply Agile to both hardware and software and IoT. Um, the next thing is uh, operationalized cross-disciplinary work. And so what we mean by this is that when you are building a connected solution that has hardware, it has firmware, it has some type of um, user interface, maybe a mobile application, it has cloud backend and architecture. These are a lot of different work streams that need to work together. And it is possible um, to have all of these work streams work together and not in a waterfall methodology where um, somebody just finishes their work stream, then puts it all on a box and passes it to the next. And this uh, illustration that I have here on the left is um, how we think of building an MVP. And if you want to build on the bottom a skateboard, you have to have cross-disciplinary work working together. Um, and you have to have regular pairing sessions. I'm gonna cover tools that we use 
um, to help kind of enable remote collaboration. Uh, the illustration on the left is saying how not to build an MVP is to start with a wheel, then put a chassis on some wheels, then put a body, but the car actually hasn't driven anywhere yet. And then at the very end, now you've got this car that can drive. That is not the approach. That's the approach if you want to waste a lot of time and money. Um, the bottom is, let's think about a skateboard. Skateboard can't go anywhere super fast, doesn't have great handling, don't have great turning capabilities, not a lot of features. It's a board with some wheels, but you can get from point A to point B. Cool. So let's build that first. Next, we need some more steering capabilities. We build a scooter. Then we build a bicycle, motorcycle. Finally, we get a car. But at every point in this process, we're building in releases where this thing, this device, this system can actually work in an end-to-end -end fashion. And um, this kind of becomes a mantra uh, down the road when we're building projects. And, and like we keep returning back to this conversation, of what's the skateboard? What's our skateboard? Um, you know, and then it's like, what's our scooter? What's the scooter? Um, so on the tools, um, we are a fully remote company and we have hardware engineers that are working day to day remotely with software engineers um, and the entire stack. And we do that because we've been extremely careful about the tools that we've chosen. All of our tools are cloud based. We've taken a microservice approach and all have an API um, or workflow automation, potentially through Zapier or, or Zapier or through Slack. Um, but all of our tools are intentionally interconnected to support a fully remote workflow. And where it can go really wrong is when you've got, you know, uh, uh, one of your engineers using a CAD system that isn't cloud-based and it's very hard for him to share his files. And then this whole house of cards comes down. And so, if you have tools as a part of your workflow and system that are not remote friendly, um, you're going to be fighting a really uphill battle. Lastly, is uh, building psychological safety. So culture is not just about hiring and talent acquisition. Um, culture is, if there is one thing that I've focused on making sure we got right or trying to always get it right and improve it and head it in kind of the right direction, nurture it in that direction, it's culture. Um, teams that trust and understand each other will generate better outcomes. Um, you know, it's kind of a platitude, but it, it, it's, it's the most important thing that we focus on is making sure that the culture is right for the company, that people um, feel comfortable raising their hand saying, I don't know something. And where projects spin out of control, where timelines get broken, where projects get behind, where budgets get blown, is when people are trying to do something new and they sit and spin on a problem and spend hours or days or weeks spinning on a problem without raising their hand. And what we're talking about is building and bringing into existence things that typically are not, have not existed before. It's doing new things, it's innovating. And a huge part of that is like wading through the unknown. Um, and so, that's where culture becomes incredibly important to make sure that people um, feel free, like I said, raising their hand as soon as they're blocked, that they feel comfortable saying they don't know something um, and that there's, you know, a, a system built around them to support the work. So um, recap here, use agile, choose agile. We talk about that later. Um, know your skateboard up front, identify what is that skateboard going to be? How can we, you know, turn around and show value to stakeholders? How can we show some early value to some customers? And finally, um, enable remote collaboration. We live in a weird time where some people are going back to the office, some people are not. Um, some companies have fully, you know, embraced, uh, you know, work from home, some have not. Um, no matter what the situation is, I think that every company would benefit from thinking through their tools and their process and their systems and enabling remote collaboration so that it doesn't matter where you physically are, uh, the work can continue. So um, I think we're going to try to leave about five minutes for questions and we are at uh, 2.25. And so, uh, yeah, open for questions.